Don't you turn that dial. Don't you turn that station because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. Seriously, folks, because our guest is Alderman John Arena. We're taping this show on, on January 27th. You'll be watching it in the next week or two. Just last week, a week from the time we're taping it on the 22nd, there was an important school board meeting. And at that meeting, the Chicago, the Chicago School Board for CPS decided to go forward with seven of 15 requested new charter schools, right? 17, actually. Yeah. Of 17. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about whether charter, charter schools are the magic elixir. We'll talk about whether that kind of choice introduces competition and innovation and improves all schools. Or does it drain resources from the traditional neighborhood schools and make things worse? You're going to find out what's the way to radically improve education. You're going to find out about whether there's a connection between education and people, kids killing each other. You're going to find out about minimum wages. Are they really good or do they hurt people? Oh, you're going to find out so much. So don't turn that station. Don't turn that dial. Because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show with Alderman John Arena. <laughs> You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game, and we will, as I promised, be doing, well, lots of public policy. There are political aspects to education and education spending and so forth, but I think the show is really more public policy this evening, some politics, uh, and, you know, it's just important stuff. So we're just going to get right to it with Alderman John Arena. He has been now, this is your third year, right? Third year, first term, yeah. Northern, Northern Illinois University grad. He's got a wife and two kids. They're mm -hmm. both in public schools, is that right? Yes, they are. Okay. He's been active in the community. You live in, in Portage Park, In right? Portage Park, correct. Been active in that area for, what, the last 15 or 20 years? Uh, yeah, 18 years. All right, so you're not a Johnny-come-lately. You just said, make me an alderman, huh? <laughs> no, I worked hard to get here. All right, so the, without fooling around, just let's get right down to it. We're taping this, as I said, on January 27th. About a week ago, the Chicago... The Chicago... Chicago School Board of the CPS. Yeah, the Chicago Board of Education. Schools. Board of Education, thanks. They voted on a requested 17 new charter schools. They only approved seven. Mm -hmm. But actually, the CPS itself only recommended how many actually be approved? The seven? They, uh, CPS analysis, they recommended nine. <clears throat> actually, there was 21 applications total. Four of those were pulled back before the actual board meeting by the applicants themselves. <clears throat> Nine of the 17 were recommended for passage by CPS, and ultimately they passed uh, for seven. And some of this that are passed are conditional, is that right? That's true. Uh, for example, Intrinsic, uh, which is a new charter school, uh, has, uh, does not have two years uh, track record of academic achievement, which is one of the requirements that's required. So they got pushed to the 2015-16 school year, at that point, they'll look at them, look at their track record, and, and kind of make a determination whether they should move forward with another campus. Are they included in the seven that are approved? Yes. So it's seven with, are four or five of those conditional? Uh, I don't know exactly how many were conditional, okay. but I know it was probably three or four of them were conditional. And why was it, why, you say there are only seven, there were nine that were recommended for approval, right? And yeah. The board only approved seven. Why were only nine recommended? Did the CPS say what happened, why they were not recommending approval of those other ones? Uh, they didn't get into the details in the testimony uh, at the time, but it, there was an RFP put together. Uh, by law, CPS has to, uh, has to accept any, pro any proposal for a charter school. So what CPS tried to do, and I think this is rational, is, is at least kind of try to funnel them down at least to a place where they could evaluate them in a rational time frame at the same time instead of taking them one off you know, throughout the course of the year. Uh, so they put out an RFP saying these are the things we'd like uh, for, for if we're going to do any expansion. Uh, the only thing is the, the individual schools didn't have to you know, do exactly what was asked in the RFP. So CPS used that as, as a bit of a test to say, well, are these in areas of need? Uh, do they meet academic standards and so forth? Uh, and some of those just didn't measure up to the standards that were put into the RFP. 
And I think that's what drove CPS's recommendation of only nine out of the 17. With the standards being basically achieving a high academic performance? Uh, being in a, a level one or uh, level two uh, in their academic achievements uh, consistently. Um, uh, I guess uh, making sure that they were uh, open to you know all children and accessible. Um, what were their physical needs? And did they have a physical location identified? Uh, either an existing building or plans to build a building? Did they have the finances to build that or re, you know, retrofit a, an existing building? So there was a, a, a long list of things that they needed to kind of be able to measure up to. Now, the, um, this is sort of a basic 101 course, almost a charter school 101 course. Mm -hmm. Because the charter schools come in, we said they get, they'll get a certain amount of money from the city, yeah. essentially, that would go to a traditional neighborhood school and the charter schools are viewed as a public school and they will get funds to operate that charter school which is taxpayer funds, right? That's true and it's measured on a per pupil basis. So and now all CPS schools have gone to a per pupil funding model. It used to be prior to this past school year that uh, there was two different models for funding. So charter schools were on a per pupil model and CPS neighborhood schools were on a kind of uh, kind of bucket model where they would each get a certain amount of money uh, that was not dictated based on the number of students that were at the school. So now it is per student, so because sometimes people say the charter schools, at least in terms of operating costs, they, well, they say that the charter schools are getting more money than the traditional neighborhood schools. Now what you're telling me is if it's all kosher, if they all do it the way they're supposed to, then it should be exactly the same in terms of operating costs charter schools get no more or no less for operating the school than would a traditional neighborhood school. Is that right? As it sits right now, charter schools get slightly less money per pupil Actually, than, than neighborhood schools, but that's because most of the time they don't have a building. Uh, they're, they're, it's covering the educational component and the programming component, but not, as I understand it, you know, uh, the, the building and right. the, the capital costs. Okay. And what is it per student that they get? Do you know what that number is? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I don't want to quote a number out of that. Well, one. because it's then it becomes all very difficult. We got to do this, really get this right sometime, and maybe get the right person to. And I'm not saying you're the wrong person, but maybe get the person who specializes in this, mm -hmm. maybe in the city, because you know if you take all of the entire budget for CPS, you know what that is approximately. Um, the whole it's, thing, it's, capital costs, very probably cost in the. Uh, well, probably in the billions of dollar range, six oh, billion dollars. Yeah, yeah, about six billion dollars. Yeah. It's been about that high, and then it went down for a year or two, and things are rough. Now it's going back up. So let's say about six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And you know there are about four hundred thousand students, right? Yeah. So if you divide four hundred thousand into six billion, if we don't use a calculator, just do some quick math. I've cheated. I've done it before. It's fifteen thousand <laughs> per kid per year, right? Okay. But they don't get. The charter school doesn't get 15000 per kid, not even close, right? Do you know what it is? I don't know the number. Yeah. So, I mean, they're saying you're not getting it because... You're getting slightly less, but well, not, I don't, well, I don't know. I, don't, I think much less. And the report card doesn't use that figure. If you ask Rom, how much are we spending per kid per year? And maybe Rom thinks this. I'm not saying he's being deceitful. He wouldn't say 15000 I bet he'd say ten, maybe mm -hmm. eleven. okay? It's just not true. It's not true. Because the budget, as you said, is $6 billion. 400,000. So anyway, it's 15,000. So they say 10 or 11, then they cut from there. And the charter school is supposed to come up with their capital costs on their own, right? Uh, yeah, initial capital. That's correct. So they've got to go to private donors and say, sort of beg, okay? Whereas the traditional neighborhood schools, they don't have to. They get that. Is it fair? Do you think that's fair? Uh, well, I, is that I fair think competition? It's public, because it's called public education. So, uh, the, you know, it, we got to step back and say, we have a system that says everybody's, uh, you know, uh, we should provide an equal education to all. Um, unfortunately, how that money's divided up from a capital standpoint hasn't been equitable across the city. It's why you have some buildings that are maintained on the north side and some buildings that are falling apart on the south and west side. So there's politics that plays into how capital is, is spent. Politics in Chicago? Can you imagine I'm something shot. like that? It's like yeah, I know it's a new idea that I'm introducing here today. Maybe? that politics would play into how we spend taxpayer dollars in different neighborhoods. And, uh, and, and it's unfortunate because 
uh, the basic principle, and what we all think, we, what I think we can all agree on is we want everybody to have access to an equal quality education, a high quality education. Uh, and we haven't been doing that. And, and that's where we, we kind of find ourselves now, is how do we dig out of the hole we've created by creating a system that's, you know, uh, that's separate but supposedly equal. Yeah. And that's where, that's where the challenge of the model of private funding for schools versus public funding and an expectation of, well, you know, you should, why do you have to go out and get capital money when these schools don't? You know, my argument is we need to focus on the broader system, which is where most of our kids are educated, in our neighborhood schools and making sure that that is equitable and a powerful, high quality well, education. Let's bring that, you didn't see it because you can't look back there. I told you you look at the I, I can't do that, I've been yeah. told. You're not the president yet. The president <laughs> Obama was here, and I said, "Don't people remember when, when he before he was president, Barack was on the show six times, and I was telling him on the first show, don't turn around and look at the other camera or the monitor because you look distorted." And showing he knew what he was doing, he did. And he looked distorted, <laughs> and he became president. There you go. But anyway, so but let me ask Mar our director Terry Paul. This is really good. If you could just bring back that last graphic that we just put up there, because it talks about some of the reform motives. And you mentioned some of them. One is equity. We want equity and fairness across the school system. Mm -hmm. The other is efficiency. We want these schools, whether they're neighborhood schools, whether they're select enrollment schools, whether they're charter schools. And charter schools are like neighborhood schools in that they're both open enrollment. So whatever kind of school it is, we want them to be efficient. And we, I would say we want some crime reduction here because most of us believe that education, if we do it right, makes people better citizens, mm -hmm. gives them the opportunity to earn a living, an honest living, and they're less likely to get involved in crime. Yeah. If, they, if, they, if a kid's in third or fourth grade and he's not learning or she's not learning how to read, the rational thing is just drop out, become a drug seller. Yeah, you might get killed, but it's probably more rational than staying in a school where you're not learning how to read, right? Well, I I'm mean, I guess I'm it's, not it's, advocating kids like you're don't <laughs> please try this kids, at home. Don't, don't follow don't that advice. And, yeah, no, but it is a rational thing, it, and it's a, it leads to the idea, and this is why it's so important. When we have that graphic, we can bring that up. That this is about saving kids. This yeah. is not an academic discussion we're having here about charter schools or voucher schools. No, no, no. This is about saving kids. Yeah. Four hundred thousand kids out there under in the CPS, and if we don't. If the taxpayers, whether you live in the city or not, or if you work in the city, we're all involved. If the adults don't figure out how to get this right, how to truly teach these kids how to read, where do we go? They're they're in trouble. They're going to be they're involved in gangs. They shoot each other. Somebody gets caught in the middle. That innocent person gets shot. So it, it really is about saving yeah. kids. And last thing I'll say, and then you can come back and comment on this, but remind people reform started. Education reform started with Mayor Richard M. Daley in 1995. Mm -hmm. And now we're 18 years later, and Rahm Emanuel has been here two years. <clears throat> and I would say, I could argue, that in the last 18 years, education has almost not improved at all. Yeah, almost our numbers not have all. not moved appreciably. We've lost an entire generation of kids. Mm -hmm. And so for people out there who say, you want more time? You want more time to try something? I'd say you got a year. I say Ram should have said you had a year when he first came in, two years, and he's done nothing. Nothing. I mean, maybe they had 15 new charter schools he might point to, maybe seven more. That's a drop in the bucket, even if he's right that the charter schools yeah. outperform. But, if they but I, I guess now it's your what turn. I will say is he has done something. He's closed 50 schools, taken 50 uh, centers of community centers out of those neighborhoods that are troubled neighborhoods. Uh, that's a big big movement, and now whether it's right or wrong, we can, we can get to, but he has done something. He has shown that there's an agenda that's, that's basically continuing in a very aggressive way, an 18-year policy uh, that Daly started and allowed to just kind of go on in, a, in an undirected way, I feel, where we're gonna start creating a system of choice. We started selective enrollment schools, magnet schools, uh, charter schools. When you said that charters and neighborhood schools are similar in that they're open enrollment, that's not entirely true. A neighborhood school has to take, by law, any child that's within its attendance boundaries. It has to accept them. Charter schools are a lottery system. 
from anywhere in the city, any student, any parent can apply to put their child into a charter school. South side, north side, west side, you can go to any school, that, any of those schools that you can get selected in that lottery. That's important because you are now saying that the neighborhood school, which is that center of our communities historically, you and I probably grew up uh, in, in communities where you went to your neighborhood school, that was, that, the ed, that was your one choice, right? But it was probably a pretty good school. It had, it had opportunities. Um, with charters, they can, when you get selected, they have to accept that student, but they don't necessarily have to keep them. They can, uh, they have tactics they use to push kids out or, or, or move them out of the school, which then the, the kid will then cycle back to a neighborhood school, hopefully, or drop out if he's a problem kid and can't get captured by the system. But that neighborhood school then has to take him back, and the money doesn't necessarily follow that student back to the neighborhood school. So there's some things going on in the background that uh, charters do pull resources away, and they are able to aggregate uh, a, a population of children that are better performing kids, that, that are not the problems uh, children that really are what trouble our system. We have to find a way to bridge that gap. A child that can't be uh, engaged in a class of 30 kids that needs that special attention, our neighborhood schools for decades have had those very resources are the ones that have been pulled away through budget cuts, whether it's social services, truant officers, uh, supports, even down to nursing care. You know, nurses, when, when children are hurt or, or need attendance, psychologists. The These thing. things have been pulled away, and teachers have been told, you have to then supplement you know, that with activity. All, with all due respect, Alderman, I've talked to some teachers, okay? Have you talked to teachers in the mm -hmm. public schools? Quite a few. Okay. Have you talked in the really, really tough areas on the south side and the west side? Where it's almost impossible to control these students. Okay, have you ever talked to anybody oh, yeah. there? Oh, this is not this is not your ward. The fifty no, forty fifth ward. No. That is not your ward. Yours is a relatively okay. affluent ward, relatively white ward. Absolutely. Hispanic, maybe twenty five percent. Mm -hmm. Seven percent Asian, two percent black, mm -hmm. the rest white. Relatively high income. You're right. This is not your work. Absolutely. Now, you talk to these people where yeah. they say they just can't control these kids. They go to the principal. The principal doesn't know what to do. The principal maybe gets fired. The principal fires the teachers. And at the end of the day, nothing happens. And those kids get weeded out who are real discipline problems, but some don't. And it's just hell. Yeah. It's not working. This is my point. Yeah. But I guess going on my for very like five minutes, I let the, you go on for five yeah. minutes, and it's not working. And all I'm saying to you, you're not coming up with anything new. I don't mean it's your job, but the mm -hmm. city of Chicago isn't. Rom came up, he said charter schools are a way of introducing competition, introducing innovation. A lot of the rules and regulations we have that don't allow for that innovation don't apply to the yep. charter schools, okay? And that's a good thing because frankly, I don't know how to do this and you probably don't know how to do this and Rom doesn't know how, but you know, in the same way we didn't know how to make smartphones 25 years ago, because my name's not Steve Jobs and mm -hmm. yours isn't, but there were people who did. Yeah. If we had competition coming into education, some people are going to figure out, how do you take these really tough kids, get their attention, motivate them, and teach them how to read? Okay. That's can I, my can I say a, a basic premise of charters when they were started? And there are certain charter operators that go towards the core of what charters were intended to do, which was that very thing you just are, uh, illuminated, which is the kids that are hard to reach, that are in social situations that are just crushing to the ability to, edu to be educated, okay? They've never learned within, within in their youth and how to become a student. And the teachers are then caretakers, they're not educators. There are like youth connection charter schools. Their mission and their focus is on kids that that the CPS, the, the average system, right? CPS was never, no system is designed to do everything from the very worst to the very best right. equally. Right. You need to specialize. You need, you need specialization. Right. Charters were designed originally, one of the very concepts of it was to say, let's find a way to bring these kids in. And there is, a, there is schools like that. What, what's happened though over time is people have said, well, hey, let's, how can we monetize this and not have to deal with that downside of, of the really expensive, to educate child that CPS can't address. That is where the charter school system has moved towards, 
let's just get towards the best, the brightest. Let's pull those kids and aggregate so. them. I think that's totally unfair. Well, I, I, I mean, I guess I, with all due respect, opinion. I mean, you only have about twelve. <clears throat> you have about twelve percent of the kids now in charter schools. About fifty thousand students. Okay. Your side has the other three hundred fifty thousand. And you got the select enrollment, the Walter Payton's okay, and the Jones, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people like Alderman Ferretti comes out and he says, oh, schools are doing fine, and he gives me Walter Payton. Now that's really deceptive. Alderman Ferretti, you come on this time and, and you give me schools that are not select enrollment that are doing exceedingly well. And no bar, you know, fooling around. You want to be mayor, Alderman Ferretti? You got to start, you know, playing straight, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So. There are charter schools who do well, who do better, and they don't do it by getting just the best kids. Number one, 85% of the kids in CPS are black or Hispanic and relatively low income. Mm -hmm. There are not, look, I'm not saying there are a bunch of bright kids, there are many bright kids sure. in that group, but in, in general, you're talking about kids who are not like the cream of the cream. Now, some of these kids want to learn and they're easier to teach, yeah. and some of these kids don't. And we need to we need to figure out how to make it a better environment for learning. And you know this thing that you said about like okay they just weed them out and the public schools don't. No, that's not. Even at Nutria, they have vocationals. They have alternative schools. When the kids don't work out at Nutria, when they can't control them, they send them somewhere else to another public school. And you folks do some of that in CPS, okay? You don't just keep the kids. They have schools that specialize. And you've got special ed schools right in your ward. Absolutely. Okay, right. What is it? Okay. Beard. Beard. Okay. Yeah. It's a special. So but it that's is for, not that's true. For students it is work. not. Yeah, but true. those are not. Excuse me. It is not true that every neighborhood school does everything. You do have specialization. I, I specifically said that that the neighborhood okay. schools are designed to, to to take the broad middle and do okay. it do and broad do middle. the best it can. Yes, that's where okay. that's where and society that's what, and public. I think so, it, if somebody if if a parent wants okay. a specific type of education, they do have choice. There's. There's private, there's parochial schools, there's all kinds of choices that, that a parent can make. Within the CPS system, we've, we've created a system where there is choice, okay. where selective enrollment has taken out of the, the high school network and put those kids into schools that are concentrating the, the higher performing children away from the, the selective enrollment. School. But that's nothing to do with charters. And no, no, no. You're, well, it's, it's, it's a charters. system, and if we only talk about so, one aspect of the system. Walter Payton's not a charter, is it? No, it's a, a it's selective a selection enrollment. enrollment school. It was designed for one thing. Okay, Daly saw he's losing business. He's he's not able to attract businesses here because he brings the business here, and it's in the city. Then these people have to go out in the suburbs. He said, No, no, I'll create some good schools. If your kids are bright, if they can yeah. test into this, they don't have to go to the suburbs. They can go to Peyton. Exactly, or Lane, or, where my son goes. Or a number I, of I'm schools. I'm lucky enough that, okay. that he goes there. But my point is, that's not the charter thing. The charter thing was to deal specifically with kids who are not that, who are low income, who are, don't have ideal environments, but maybe they want to learn, but they still do a lottery, okay? Yeah. So the kids who go to the charter school, they won the lottery. The kids who don't, they lost. Their parents are generally the same, same motivation. Some people say, oh, the charter school has the, no. And then people study this, okay? We're not gonna yeah. go through all those studies, but people who study this, they look at the same kids from the same socioeconomic background, same parents, same motivation, and guess what? The charter schools on average, Carol Marie, the charter schools on average outperform the traditional neighborhood schools. Someday we'll yeah. have a debate on that. We We're will, not gonna do it because tonight. the data doesn't show that. Well, I think it does. Okay, so. And in your own district, in your, I've looked at some of those words, they're, they're, they're you know, Certainly in the high schools, you've got a relatively small percentage of kids taking AP classes and a very small percentage who are passing those classes. And when you looked at your grade schools in terms of the report cards, and I've done some of this, and we'll mm -hmm. have more time, I'll go through and give you a chance. But I've done some of this, and you see on those report cards, maybe 9, 12 percent exceed, exceed the level. I've been told by the experts, that's the level that shows the kid in third or fourth grade is on that college path. Mm -hmm. So you get 10 to 12 percent of the kids who are essentially reading at grade level, doing math at grade level. With all due respect, the schools are not really doing justice in your own ward. I'm not arguing that. I'm not, I walked in. We, it's not we because of system. Charter, excuse me, it's not because of charter I'm not, schools. Okay. It's, not, it's because, not because of charter schools. And I started this by saying for 18 years we've been taking a path that hasn't done anything to say 
we can create a few selective enrollment schools and a few magnets and a few charters, and it's not enough to, that, that deals with the broad middle of kids we're supposed to be educating at a high level. We have we abdicated that and it, so that we could get a few successes so we could show the business community here, there's still an opportunity in Chicago. It was the short-term win at the expense of the long-term gain about repurposing the system and figuring out within a broad system of how we educate our kids. So with change to a selective enrollment, and we talked, we, we talked about this a little bit before. It's selective enrollment is, is a distraction because it's still a very small percentage of the kids. I, I, my point exactly. And we're focusing, get, even we're if focusing get, on even Shures High School. If you try to say that Shures High School, if you try to say that Shures High School, which has not gotten the resources that schools like Jones, that schools like Lane, well, they got that a schools lot of like resources. What, that's the thing. They, they have not gotten a lot of resources compared 15? to these. We spent 120 million dollars, yeah. 120 million dollars on Jones Elementary to put a pool on the fourth floor, okay. so it could be a showpiece for the for a class in this in this uh, in our society and ignore the middle and the lower class. You want to know what it changes education it, it for across the board, household income. There's a direct line between household income and the and and whether a child performs well in school. Not true. Be, yeah, no. absolutely, absolutely true. Not. It is absolutely true. Have you ever heard of Health Have you ever heard of Health Franciscan? No. It's a black school, black kids on the south side. They send 96% of those kids, and that's from a not a high socioeconomic area. Where? To four-year colleges. So it is not true that these kids are not. Is that educable. a free school? To, is that a free open school, or are those parents it's, paying? The, no, it's a tuition. I mean, it's a tuition-based no, 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 school. No, it's like a four or five thousand dollar tuition, and some of them are on scholarship. Okay. okay. I'm it's saying not the same. It, no, you guys, we're, you we're guys talking in the about, city, you guys in the city are about spending tiny 15, seconds per of kid. the population. Excuse me, you guys are spending 15,000 per kid per year on average. They're spending 5,000 and do a better job. They're spending more than 5,000. Oh. That is, there's no, there's no school so that's operating at that level. You road. can find St. Joseph, no. you can find a number of parochial schools who are doing just that. They are spending much less and getting better results with kids who are black, who are Hispanic. How many kids attend are, that school? And what is the teacher-student ratio? It's not so it's different. It's not no, 30 it really kids. It, I guarantee okay. you it's not 30 right. kids per We've class. We've got to come back. We've got to cover a few topics okay. quickly. Minimum wage is coming up, right? Yep. Uh, you know, basic economics. You ever take a course in economics? In college, yeah. Yeah. And remember, if you raise the wage, the dam goes down and the supply goes up. If you have a minimum wage, you raise the wage above the market wage, which is what unions do as well. Demand goes down, supply goes up. You cause unemployment. Do you understand that? I don't agree with it, but, but that's every eighty okay. percent of the economists would tell you that. You don't have to be a conservative economist. Yeah, eighty percent of the Milton economists Freeman. said that we were doing just fine rolling into two thousand six, two thousand seven. Not really. And we're no, at the, not the last, really. Well, no, not that's, really. Yeah, that's okay. what we heard over and over again. So no, no, the, the minimum people, wage yeah. adjusted for inflation. That, minimum wage was started in somewhere in the nineteen early nineteen sixties. Adjusted for inflation. Uh, you would be at about $10 an hour if you just adjusted for inflation. If you adjust for productivity, you should be about $15.